are a blended family. We 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 are a blended family. And we are a blended family. Hi, we're Doctors Larry and Carol Snap. We're glad to have you with us today. Yeah, this afternoon here in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Blended Families Ministry class. This is lesson one out of 12. And uh, Dr. Larry Snap is getting ready to explain to you what is a godly marriage. This is lesson one. Thank you, Carol. I want to give a shout out to ChristianLivingRadio.com. They broadcast our lessons. Occasionally they actually come in and do it live. But uh, we do the go live, the video part. We also capture the audio, which then they take and put on their website. Big announcement. We just found out that we are available on iHeartRadio. Cool. All the podcasts are on iHeartRadio. So, yeehaw. And that's all over the world. Yeah. I that. So you can uh, even hear us anywhere that you can get to the web. Which you could anyway with Christian Living, but uh, iHeartRadio, we're we're out there now, as of about a week ago, I guess. Okay, what is a godly marriage? It's a good place to start. Uh, this is Blended Families, Blended Families Ministry. Uh, our website is blendedfamiliesministry.org, and all the resources are available out there. I feel like it's important to start with what did God design marriage to be in the beginning? And then we go from there. And it, it takes 12 weeks to get there. Uh, at least. At least. Uh, okay, so, you know, in the beginning, right, it's Genesis. Uh, we look at uh, chapter 1, verse 26. Let us make man in our image. So we see that it's let us make man in our image. Right? So that's the Trinity. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit all kind of, what's up? Hey, let's make man, okay? I'm in. And so God created man. And we see that he created man from the earth. And part of why he did that was with a purpose. God always has a purpose to whatever he does. But the purpose in creating man was to take dominion over the earth and everything in it and multiply his image. Because he created man in his image. Right? So he told them, once he created woman, he created man from the earth, but he created woman from the man, for the man. Now, in between these two, you know, got into all these animals and everything else out there, and Adam had to name everything. So it, it was just him for who knows how long. I mean, There's a lot of animals. It could have been in a matter of years. Who knows? But he, God created Adam, and then Adam was given the task of naming all the animals. And then after he had finished that job, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. Because there was no animal that was anywhere close to being compatible, comparable to Adam. So God said, okay, I will create a helpmate for you. And he kind of knocked Adam on the head, put, knocked him out. Took a rib from Adam out of the side, not out of the head, not out of the foot, or anywhere else, out of the side, so that he would have a companion to come alongside him. Now, just having been a computer programmer for a lot of years, so I just kind of if, then, else, do kind of logic kind of thing. It, it makes it easier for me to understand if I think of it as Adam had the entire image of God in him. 
because that was God's image. Now, God created man, male and female, which those are all included in God's image. But it makes it easy for me to understand that if he took the female part of God's image out of Adam, who had the complete image, he took out the female part and made a woman out of the man, right? It just makes it easier to understand it for me anyway. And then he tells the two of them, mostly Adam, to leave your father and mother and become one flesh. Now, God was the only father. There weren't any mothers, right? But the husband was to leave his father and mother and become one with his wife. So the idea of becoming one flesh is to continue the original one flesh. Put the two parts back together so that the image is complete once again. So that's why we see where uh, divorce is like ripping the flesh apart. So that's one reason God hates it is because it goes and rips that one flesh apart. And uh, I guess in the old King James, you know, let not man tear asunder, you know, what God put together. And, you, okay, asunder, you know, whatever. Looking it up, it's like that's the ripping of flesh. And an example of that is like, you know, you run through an old house or an old barn or something, there's all these old nails sticking out from all the wood and everything. It's like you catch one on the fleshy part of your arm or something, and it just <laughs> tears a chunk out. That's tearing asunder. It just rips. It's not a nice cut or anything like that. It's just rip. Okay. So the whole point then of man creating the woman for the man was so that his image could be one image in two parts. So it was the continuity of his original one image, one flesh. Okay. So that was the beginning of marriage. And... Adam understood that this woman was his wife. So uh, it also points out the fact that God was kind of letting them know that there's probably going to be in-law problems. That's why you need to leave your father and mother and and just be one with your wife, right? Down the road, (laughs) there's going to be problems with in-laws, even though there weren't any at the time. Okay. I had a question. Yeah. Just a, a thought to interject in there. He told the man to leave father and mother. Why didn't he tell the woman to do that? <laughs> yeah. Well. Or was it could be. Understood? I think it was. If we go back to this one here, God creates a woman from the man for the man. Uh, there were there were a lot of things that you know the Bible doesn't tell us every single thing we got to know, yeah. right? It's principles and history and commands and a whole bunch of things. It's just not every single little detail. Yeah. But I think, especially back then, man was first. Woman was second. Yeah. The one it was just kind of understood that the woman would follow the man, yeah. right? And the man was given the instructions to leave his family okay. and take his wife and do his own thing, okay. right? <laughs> it's uh, kind of one of the reasons, you know. Every it, most everything is a patriarchy <laughs> thing, and now there's a whole bunch of pushback on that whole thing. And Equal opportunity wasn't around then. Yeah. <laughs> direction for the man to leave and take the woman, isn't it inherent that the woman has the same instruction basically even though it's not specific the same the man? I, I think you could go there. That kind of, I mean, you got to be careful with assumption. 
because assume is you know <laughs> we know where that goes. But uh, maybe, maybe God knew that as women we were already going to have that common sense to leave our, our <laughs> mother and father, oh, wow. and as men he was going to have to you know be specific. Uh, <laughs> now, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, that's important because, that, like you said earlier, a lot of times there is in law issues, but really on both sides. And yeah. probably sometimes more on the woman's side. Uh, and the, the command was leave. Yeah. Leave and cleave, yeah. right? So. Who's the leader? Who do you make first? Adam. Yeah, see, that's right? why you have to tell Adam. Yeah, he... he all joking aside. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, you know, we, we look at, you know, when sin enters, mm-hmm. right, he's already, he, before sin, he's even saying, uh, you need to make sure you leave and cleave, and, yeah. you know, because there's going to be problems with in-laws. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I already knew that ahead of time. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, he also knew sin was coming. But... Once the sin came in, and then God uh, spoke curses on things, you know, it, it was on the earth for Adam. But for Eve, one of the curses, besides the childbirth pain, was that she's going to want to be in charge. And that's part of the curse, right? Now, because of that curse, there's built in conflict in marriage from the get go, right? And part of the curse was you're going to want to be in charge, but you'll have to be in submission to your husband and he will rule over you. Now, that rule over you is like an evil king. That's kind of what that rule over implies. Is It's not going to be nice. So we get into this later on in the class, down the road a ways. But the only way to get this done the way God really wants it is through the Holy Spirit. If we're in our flesh, that's not going to happen. That curse is going to be in effect. All right, and the desire is going to be to want to be in charge, and you know, like Stephanie said, you know, you have single parents, you know, that are used to just doing their thing, and then they try to get together with somebody, and if they have kids, uh oh, you know, but just having your own, there's going to be a problem because. We get into this with the pyramid. You, a single parent tends to want to own their children. But in the class here, we want people to understand that these are God's kids. He gave them to you. He wants you to train them up in the way they should go. And then give them back. So we have to be good stewards. Good stewards, not owners. Um wrote a little thing a couple of weeks ago about that that you know there's a parable about a vineyard that the owner said yeah hey I'm going to be gone for a while take care of my stuff and then the people who are taking care of it after some time they felt like they owned the place and when anybody came to collect they beat him up or anything so finally sent the son to collect and they killed him which was Jesus right so it's important to understand the difference between an owner and a steward God gives us a whole bunch of stuff he always owns it all he owns everything and he gives it to us to be stewards so it's a big difference yeah we have a free will we got to be good stewards of what God has given us just in our own flesh here Right. So, speaking on submission, okay, this is my flow chart from computer days. <laughs> uh, kingdom on this side, marriage on this side, they kind of look alike. A lot of similarities. Okay, you have the head. In the kingdom, it's Father God. And then we have the Son, which is Jesus. And then we have the Bride, which is the Church. And you got the Holy Spirit that gives the Bride, you know, kind of 
the, the wherewithal to do what it needs to do. Okay, that's in the kingdom. Everything goes up. The bride is in submission to, the, to Jesus, the church. That's his bride. Jesus is in charge. The father is in charge of the son. The son doesn't do anything the father doesn't tell him to do. And part of the leave and cleave thing, you know, in the Old Testament days, when there was going to be a marriage, there was the betrothal and everything else, so the bridegroom was basically told, okay, go prepare a house. And that's what you know, it's leave and cleave. Go make your house. That's where you're going to live. You're not going to live here. <laughs> right. So the bridegroom goes off and he's building his house and everything. And the father tells the son when he's ready. When the house is complete. When the house is ready. When the, the son is ready to go get his bride and all that. And we see even in, in the scripture that Jesus doesn't know when he's coming back. Right. Now, he went away to make houses, right? He's going to have a mansion right. for us, right? Yeah. So there's a similarity there. There's that uh, example that because of the way it works in the kingdom, it's supposed to work that way in real life. That in marriage, you know, the and today it's, you know, it's all messed up. But back then, the husband to be would go off create a place to live the father would tell him okay the house is ready you're ready go get your bride and back in those days generally when everything was getting ready to be like one of the the, the banquet for the betrothal so they're not married yet but they're getting ready they would have his side of the family on one side of the table and her side on the other side of the table father, mother, siblings, you know, all that kind of stuff. The groom-to-be would be on one end, the bride-to-be would be on the other end of the table, and the families would be on the sides. The husband-to-be would take a loaf of bread, take off a little piece, and set it down her side of the table. He was saying, I'm going to be the provider for your daughter. I'm promising to be the provider for your daughter. And if anybody along the way said, mm, I don't think so, then they would just hang on to the bread. So then the bride to be wouldn't get the bread. End of story. Okay. Now she would have a cup of wine. She was basically promising to be the bloodline the children for you know having the kids but it was his name and his family's side of the table that she was going to say I will continue your family right. he's going to be the provider he sends the bread down their side she has the wine <laughs> she sends it down his side of the family and the same thing if any of them were like nah they would just hang on to the cup and he wouldn't get it. So that was just to make sure everybody was like, okay, we're cool with this. And if, if anybody wasn't, then that was it. When you said that about the wine, I thought about the fruit of the vine mm -hmm. and that she could be fruitful, meaning, mm -hmm. you know, right. produce children for the mm -hmm. red wine, yeah. Right. right. But that, we look at that as one of the reasons why when there's a wedding, generally, the wife takes the husband's name because it's his name that's being multiplied, right? Legacy. The legacy, yeah. He's, he has said, okay, I'm going to be the provider. And, you know, everything's all messed up now. It doesn't really look like that too much. But that's the way it was supposed to be. And that's kind of why it is the way it is because you could look at that ceremony that he sends the bread down her side, she sends the wine down his side, and if everybody's good, they each get the opposite <laughs> thing. So that's kind of the way marriage was set up to be 
the way God intended. Um, you know, we look at this. Okay, now in marriage, there are three kinds of submission, not just the one. On this side, it's just one way. Up. <laughs> in a marriage, we still have, we have Christ as the head of the husband who is also the head of the wife. Now, I have three different submissions here. The first one, and it reinforces the pyramid over there. We'll get to that after a bit. The husband, number one, is he has to have submission to Christ. That's number one. And the wife, number one, is the submission to Christ. So, as it says on the pyramid, the first most important thing is to have a vertical relationship with Christ as an individual. Number two, in Ephesians 5, it says submitting one to another. 5.21 or something like that. So, you each individually submit to Christ, then you submit to each other. Husband and wife. Husband and wife. And then, later in Ephesians 5, it says, and then the, you know, the wife shall submit to her husband as he submits to Christ. All right? So, just logic says, if, you don't, if you're not doing number one and you're not doing number two, you never get to number three. Right. Yeah, there'll be conflict with number two. Yeah. You, that, that's yeah. part of that conflict thing from the yeah. curse. Yeah. Right? The wife is going to want to go this way. <laughs> Although she's not really getting up to here if she's not doing this so it, it always gets back to the curse but what we find out that marriage is spiritual warfare if you hadn't noticed you know one of the first things that happened after God created a husband and a wife Satan comes along and tries to mess it up right and he was successful because we're human and we screw up yeah, anything that God creates, Satan wants to tear it up, mm-hmm. or mess it up, distort it, permute, uh, pervert it. So things are, you know, we live in a fallen world. And one thing we need to understand is God is for us. Mm-hmm. He is for us. Mm-hmm. Satan is against us. So life in general, marriage in particular, is spiritual warfare. When you have those kind of Jesus glasses, here, let me see. Put them on the screen. Yeah, get them on the thing here. So if you have a pair of Jesus glasses that you wear 24-7, then you look at the world from a spiritual perspective. Mm-hmm. You look at a spiritual warfare going on. Yeah, what would Jesus say? And what would Jesus do? So it's it's that important, you know, if you just go along and you know, well, it's just the way it is, then you're going to be uh, falling prey to the enemy most of the time. Mm-hmm. So when we look at marriage as spiritual warfare, then we understand this one down here your spouse is not your enemy the devil is we found that out the hard way but fortunately when we had counseling that was one of the first things our counselors told us I was like oh well that explains a lot (laughs) you know even when we were when we understood this, we still went through like four months of hell mm-hmm. after a big mess because it sure looked like our spouse was the enemy. Mm-hmm. I mean, screaming, hollering, all kind of yucky stuff going on. It was like, wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but understanding this gives you the power and authority over the enemy. Mm-hmm. God has given you the Holy Spirit, which is way more powerful than the enemy. So, okay, in marriage, 
you understand the submission thing, it's, it's just, it mirrors the kingdom of God. Okay? Christ needs to be the head, then the husband, then the wife, and everybody submitting to everybody, and that's all good. You put your faith in God, not your spouse. Again, that's part of the pyramid. You know, that personal vertical relationship with God comes first. Because that's your source. It's like a power strip, right? You plug the power strip into the wall. And then you plug stuff into the power strip. You don't plug the power strip into itself. Because then nothing happens. Put your faith in God, not your spouse. You get filled from above so you can pour out. If you don't get filled, you just share stuff back and forth. And if somebody, or both in most cases, are less than full, you're basically just going to be sucking the life out of each other. So put your faith in God, not your spouse. Develop a covenant mentality. Marriage is supposed to be a covenant, not a contract. It's not a commitment. It's a covenant. It's I promise till death do us part. Okay? That's the way God wanted it. That's the way he set it up. Again, we live in a fallen world. People get divorced. What they've done, they've used the law to break a covenant. So they've gone from grace back under the law. Okay? Develop the mentality of, I'm in this forever. So you have to have an attitude that, I'm looking at this, you know, 20 years down the road. Not two months down the road. Or two days. If you're looking at stuff right here, you don't want to mess with it. But if you're looking down the road, this is like no big deal. Because you're still going to be together 20 years from now. And laughing about what was happening today. Because you survived. I remember being told, you know, not to ever let the the word divorce come up. Because if you have that mentality that, oh, I can always get out of it by getting a divorce, you don't have that covenant mentality. Right. So anything that happens... The enemy will let you use that as to reinforce that mindset. Mm -hmm. But when you have that covenant mentality, you know that it's a spiritual warfare. Marriage is a spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, you hear about especially very wealthy people getting prenups. Mm -hmm. That's basically saying, I know things are going to get screwed up, so I'm just going to protect myself. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's not a covenant. Yeah. That's, and that's the difference between a covenant and a contract. The contract is, as long as you do what you say you're going to do, I'm good. Likewise, if, as long as I'm doing what I, I'm supposed to do, we're good. But as soon as somebody doesn't live up to what's in the contract, you're out. Sarah. I think this is better to, um, I think it's better to wait and to make sure for the second marriage, that this is the one. Oh, yeah. It is a lifetime. Oh, yeah. And I don't think that's happening in society because second and third marriages break up faster. Right. Right. So it's better to wait. And if you think, if you, they know from the first divorce how painful it is and all the crap you go through. Oh, sure. <laughs> like, why would you do it again? But then the yeah. divorce rate's even higher. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. Each time you do it, it's it's quicker to get, I mean, the the odds. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, sure, some work. It's better to wait to get that second marriage or that third sometimes marriage. Yeah, confirmation. And that's why we do the premarital for blended is to let people know what they're getting into. Right. Right? Karen mentioned landmines earlier. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. there are landmines. And most everybody just steps all over them because they don't know any better. I was going to say they don't have a clue. You know, okay, put faith in God, not your spouse, develop a covenant mentality, have the right attitude about things, control your thoughts. That's where you win. Choose your battles. Is it really worth talking about? Well, yeah. Now, I did that for a long time and then I couldn't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 23 years and then I blew up okay yeah. but it's it's important to 
have the right attitude about what you're doing. All right? If, if you're doing it God's way, then you do it His way. You, know, you just do it. But we right? didn't know any better. Well, right? yeah, we didn't do church for 20-some yeah, we years. Know. Now we do. I, I ran the house for 23 years. He never said no. Whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do, and then all of a sudden... Uh, he speaks. Once in a while, I speak. <laughs> um, now, one of the things that's again, this goes kind of goes back to that curse in the garden. Okay, you can't fix your spouse. Right. It's God. That's right. <laughs> God is not in the spouse changing business. Right. Don't use your spouse as a project. <laughs> you don't want a project. Leave that to God. Okay. God is in the you changing business. You know, focus on your own vertical relationship, not everybody else's. You need to hear his comment. Yeah. And I just bought paint. Yeah. <laughs> I made a really bad habit when we first got married of trying to fix everything that I thought was wrong with him. And then I had somebody tell me, who are you to fix what God created? And I was like, what? And I was like, quack. Like, what? Yeah. Like, what do you mean, who am I to fix what God created? I'm his wife. That's my job, right? He's like, no, it's not no, your job. It is oh, not God. your job. <laughs> it's your job to fix you. Right. God works on you. He does it. Uh, he works on everybody. But from your perspective, he's not working on them because of you. That's good. That's good. He's working on them. And that is something that I learned, um, especially in here. I, before my prayers were, God, change him. God, change him. And, and after starting, uh, starting Blended Families, my prayers began to, God, let him see the change in me. Let him desire, you know, what I have, what you have given me. And slowly but surely, he's been changing him. Hmm. And, I mean, he's taking a whole 360, you know, to who he was when we first started dating, to who he is now. Yeah. I mean, he's more involved. Um, we put the kids in soccer here at Dream City. You know, he's up in every morning. Now he's the one that wakes wakes us up, you know, and says, hey, we got to get to church. Versus, you know, before it was like, well, I'll give you one Sunday a month. I'm like, okay, I guess, you know. So That's a start. Yeah, so it went from one Sunday a month to him waking us up every morning so we could, you know, every Sunday morning so we could get ready for church. So. Yeah. So the, the thing about a marriage, uh, see, God created one from the man for the man. Her job is to build him up. Now the wife is going to have the husband that she builds. Right. But that's okay. Wow. <laughs> so when he, when, uh, wow. <laughs> when he tells me when he tells me that I'm stuck with him forever I mean should I see that as a promise or a threat? <laughs> yes. A promise. <laughs> it could go either way. It depends. No, it, that's a promise. <laughs> tell him, stop threatening me. That's not nice. No, that's. Look at it as a promise. Right? <laughs> that that's a promise. So then it's a promise. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, see, I'm like, that's not nice. You're threatening me. Yeah. Yes. See, that's. Security. That's part of this attitude, right? It's, yeah. Part of our attitude is how do you look at what's happening, right? If you got your Jesus glasses on, you would look at that as a promise and a blessing. And a blessing. Oh my God. And if you don't look, if you don't have your glasses on, it's going to look more like a threat. <laughs> okay, you got your glasses on or not? How are you going to look at it? When we first got married, putting into that, because I had a similar experience. Um, it was I read a Power of a Praying Wife by mm-hmm. Stormy Amartya. Oh yeah, very good. And she says in there, and it was so funny because it's exact as I was reading. It was, it was what I was going through, and I kept saying, "God, fix this man. He, he's broken. Like, fix him. He's I don't know what he's thinking, but that's not right. <laughs> like, you just need to fix him, fix him, fix him." And it got reversed on me, and it was God changed me. And I'm like, "There's nothing wrong with me." <laughs> but I, I, I really I made that. A prayer it was you know your famous three word prayers I was just like God changed me 
change me, change me. Help me to, and then it became, help me to understand what I'm doing in this combative situation to make him react the way he does. And then he would give me another way to respond, not react. There you go. I would start responding to him. I would walk up to him out of the blue. How can I pray for you? When you, I noticed he was upset or uneasy or angry. And it was like a complete 180 in his attitude. Yeah. Well, that works. (laughs) See? So it's, there's proof. Attitude is, it really is. It's, and when, when you get this and you wrap your head around the fact that it is spiritual warfare, there's an enemy that wants to destroy you. He wants to rob your peace, right? He wants you to do the wrong stuff. Like wake him up at midnight. Tom, we need to talk about it now. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, I'm after my own heart. We, we've been there, done that. We got about it. We used to do 11 o'clock. <laughs> I don't even wait till midnight. Can can we talk about it the next? Can we talk about it tomorrow? So right at midnight. (laughs) Hey, it's tomorrow. It's twelve oh one. Let's go. Sorry, we're talking about now. It's the next day. I was like, no, it's not. I just got like five minutes of sleep. Right. Uh, Like you said, tomorrow. (laughs) It's tomorrow. We would. We did our daily prayer together (laughs) as we're going to bed. And like I'm just about asleep, and then I get this elbow. I have a question. Eleven o'clock at night. And then we'd be up till four or five. Yeah, and he had to go to work at six. That was part of the hell. It was four months of hell. That was part of that. Um, I actually think that would be. I'd be cool with that. <laughs> His passion is talking. No, my, my passion is God and teaching the things of God. And, yeah. But well, you know, we we had this dead horse. And we just kick it, to, and it was so dead. We just keep kicking it, you know. That wasn't in the equation then. Oh, okay. We didn't know. We really didn't this. get. This is way before this ministry, yeah. anything. So, okay, you can't fix your spouse. Focus on your vertical. Give up your right to be offended. Mm-hmm. Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They don't know what they're doing. They're the idiot. You know what you're doing. Pray for them. Okay? Pray together daily. That's part of our counseling homework. It creates intimacy with the one you pray to, which is our Father, with your spouse, and for family, neighbors, coworkers, whoever else. Uh, in your speech, edify one another, right? You get. Ladies, you get the husband you build, edify them. Don't tear them down. And we already said your spouse is not your enemy. The devil is. And I want to go over the pyramid. Well, I was going to end it with um, showing them quickly how to pray. Like, go ahead and do oh. that quick thing. Yeah, you might make sure that's pointing the right way. Um, On the camera. <laughs> Put a great job. (laughs) Okay. Uh, I just want to go over the uh, pyramid here real quick. We've talked about it quite a bit. We've referenced it four or five times already. God's relationship priority pyramid uh, starts off with a pyramid, triangle. You have God at the top. You have a husband. You have a wife. The whole point of that is as you individually get closer to God, you get closer together. Right? So that's how that works. Number one here, personal vertical relationship. That's eternal. You're going to have it forever. Spend some time working on it. That's the one that's going to get you into heaven. <laughs> okay. So after your relationship with God, the next one is the marriage relationship. The husband and the wife, the spouses. That's supposed to be a covenant. Till death. So you have eternity, and you have till death that was part. Number three is where everybody screws it up. In a blended family, anyway. The parent child relationship. It, the marriage has to come before the parent child relationship. If you're going to succeed, you guys got to be on the same page, especially with the parenting. Parenting disagreements tear most blended families apart. If it's not finances, it's parenting. 
Okay. Again, we talked about it a little bit ago. You're supposed to be stewards, not owners. Somewhere 18, 25 years, somewhere in there, you know, you, you've done your job, you've raised them up in the way they should go, but now it's time to give them back to God because you're just a steward. He's the owner. He wants his kids back. You can keep your spouse. He doesn't say that. Yes. You say that. I figured that out from Job. <laughs> God never took Job's wife. <laughs> he took everything else. He never took the wife. Um, okay, so you're stewards, and everything you do in the marriage lets the kids know how to do marriage. You're teaching them. You're being the example. You're not being all wild and crazy and then fighting all the time because that's what they're learning to do, if that's what you're doing. So do it God's way so that your kids know how to do it God's way. And you, you stop those generational curses that way. Uh, so after your own kids, the immediate family, that's the extended family, in-laws, outlaws, exes, uh, you know, the grandparents, siblings, co-workers, whoever you may have a relationship with outside of your house. Um, some of those need to have some boundaries. You know, everybody's got crazy Uncle Harry. You know, he's family, but he's a little weird. You know, you, you just have to have a boundary there. Uh, after your family comes the job, career. You take care of your family. Your job is, allows you to take care of your family, right? Some jobs are for a season. God gives, he can take away. I found that out. I thought I was cool for a while. Ten years ago, I got retired. Surprise! Um, so a job is for a season. It's a gift from God. So appreciate it. Be grateful that you got what you got. <clears throat> Ministry. Who? It's at the bottom. You got to have your house in order to do ministry. How many pastors do you know that have a family that's all messed up? It's because they got the ministry, their church, ahead of their family. That's not the way God wants it. Ministry is a job. Therefore, it comes after the family. So everything, each time you get further down, you find a way. And if you are doing a ministry, your first ministry should be your spouse. Again, you come back up to the top of the pyramid again. So God is first. If you're married, it's your spouse. Okay, if you're not married, okay, then your kids, if you have any. Uh, anybody else after that, it just it keeps reinforcing itself. Any... Makes sense? I've always, um, I went to the conference and I've struggled with this pyramid for a year only because <laughs> I'm always curious as to why ministry is so far down. When it should, when it be higher up? Be, well, just, you, what, in, in Timothy, it tells if you want to be a pastor of a church or something like that, you got to have your house in order. Yeah. So you have to have your marriage in good standing. You have to have your kids under control. <laughs> all these kind of things. We're working on that. Well, but that's why it's down the bottom. You have to have all of that in order. Your ministry is not going to be very productive if your family's all messed up. It's kind of like dominoes. If your dominoes are askew, right. it's not going to happen. Yeah. And, it, I mean, it, it kind, of, kind of sucks because I'm, I'm here in the class. Um, supposed to be learning, but the... the what I'm always telling her is uh, scripture also says that for the elder women to teach the younger women to keep the house and to be submissive to their husbands so that of course is part of the ministry so if, just like for the husband he has to make sure that his house is in order before he can take care of the church of God Mm -hmm. for the women to do the same if they're not living that example yeah. they can't be that example right you can't so, give what you don't have I have to be able to, to run the house in a godly manner 
before I can be put into ministry, uh, the wife also has to give right. that example but before she can teach people. Kind of comes back up to the beginning here. You have to have your own self in order. Yeah. To be able to do anything with anybody else. But right. Right. It's not your job to point out to her her faults. Right. Any more than it's her job to point out your faults. You both are in alignment with God first. Mm-hmm. And these are things that, like what we heard for the first time. So these are goals. We want to get there. We're not there yet. We want to get to these goals. So, like when people come into the class and they hear these things, they we got to do that right away. Well, it would be great if that could happen, but it's a process. You have to change some things to, in order to get there. So, I don't want either one of you to feel like, well, we're not doing it right. Oh, heavens, you're just finding out these are the things you need to do. Right. In the last three months, I've learned to back off of him a lot. Mm-hmm. And I've just kind of shut my mouth and let him operate how he feels he needs to. And lo and behold, things work out just fine when I shut my mouth. <laughs> but I also, about three months ago, it's kind of, I guess, what um, triggered the change, I guess. I had, again, some, a really good friend of mine kind of speak into my life and tell me, have you ever thought that you're raising somebody's wife? And I went, ooh, there's somebody in trouble. Oh, oh no. And, and I didn't realize until about two weeks ago, my 15-year-old looked at me and she said, Mom, I'm not getting married. Men just cause you problems. And I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, no, that's... not exactly. A lot of the problems you've seen me have, I've caused myself. Yeah. And she's oh. like, oh, I don't see how. And I'm like, oh, what did I do? Yeah. <laughs> well, see, that, but, that goes back again. We can go back to the pyramid. The, the purpose of marriage is, you know, to, to multiply, right? But you're multiplying God's image. That's the purpose of marriage, to perpetuate God's image. And, you know, if, if our father is the father of lies, that's what's getting pr- pr- promoted. So it, it goes back to the pyramid. God's got to be first for each. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not like one of us is doing it and the other one's not. Because then it <laughs> it all falls over. And when we talk to young kids, we talk to teenagers a lot of times. A lot of times they've even been in a classroom. The parents come in and say, you know, they need to hear what you're saying. We say, fine. Now, some of the topics we talk about are a little uncomfortable because we can't say as much as we'd like to because there's maybe a 12-year-old in here. But what we tell the gals, when you go out on a date... Make sure he opens the door for you to the car, to the restaurant, wherever. That he treats you nice with and with the respect. And the bottom line is that he's looking at you from here up. Right. So he's looking at your eyes to the windows of your soul, not looking at your body. And we tell the guys, you gotta treat that woman right, that gal right. She could be the mother of your children. You respect her like you respect your mother. I mean, we really talk to the teenagers. And it's true. You know, not not many people say that much to the kids. They say, oh, well, they'll figure it out themselves. No, they need to be told. They really need to be told. But we are to teach them, like, like this pyramid says, what a godly marriage is. We didn't know. 23 years we were married. That was my, this is my third marriage. Twice I got it really wrong. Larry got lucky enough it the first time around, so he doesn't get too much. Is that what you said? <laughs> no. A lot of times, and I just think like that, sometimes people think that ministry means serving God or is God. And it's, it's, it's what we do for God, but it's not that relationship. We want to develop that relationship with God, and then all this other one falls in line, and yeah. it's perfectly and decently in order. This it runs like a well-oiled machine. Yeah. A lot of people, especially like pastors of a church, they, in their minds, the work of God yeah. is God. So the difference. Yeah. I mean, it's the difference between a personal relationship and I'm doing the work I'm supposed to be doing. Right. And they put the work up here. 
and can, they don't do the relationship. I can kind of understand that because we are starting our own business, and I kind of do all the paperwork and the keeping track of stuff, like breaking out the invoices and the estimates and things, but that is what I do for him. That's not my relationship with him. Exactly. Two different things. Yeah. And that's, and especially with a couple that's in business together, like our daughter and son-in-law, he was a chiropractor, she was an office manager. It, it, just doing the, the work together sometimes created problems in the house. I try not you know. to let it. I, sometimes I really do. Cause he'll make estimates, and he tells me how he bids the jobs. I'm like, that doesn't make no sense. But it's, it's. I guess it's how the industry works. I don't. I don't know. He does contracting, so he's. Some jobs aren't bid the same. Yeah. And then I'm sitting at home. I'm like, you make no sense. You're so confusing. When it's already been three hours after the fact, and I'm like, I can't believe it. So yeah, mm-hmm. I get it. We it's even, trying we, to find a balance. We even know somebody was going to fire their spouse. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it's it, it makes it more difficult because you're together all the time, yeah. right? And you know, it's just our nature. You know, familiarity breeds contempt, right? The yeah. more you spend with somebody, the better you know them. It's our nature, our sinful nature, to start finding faults, mm. and then. You know, it goes downhill from there, so. I got something to add to that. Think about with families, you know, you'd say, leave your work at at work, don't bring it home. Mm -hmm. But when you work together, it's kind of hard to get that separation. Yeah, exactly. Because you could could have a bad day at the office, and then where do you go? Yeah, because you (laughs) go home. Yeah. And sometimes for me, too, it's, I guess I get a little, I don't know what the word would be, I guess contentious with him sometimes, because... I'm, I'm like I want, just want to be home and I want to do you know make sure everything's set up at home, but I'm so busy doing stuff for here or there, or I'm, and I just yeah. I guess I get well, mad at him for it when it's really not his fault. It's one of those fruits of the spirit of long suffering mm-hmm. or long patience, suffering. patience. <laughs> Like patience, I'm, I'm hell! I want to kill something. Be patient or become one. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, okay. Well, that that should wrap it up. We're a little long here, but uh, you know, do that prayer. How to teach how to pray? I was going to do late? that. I don't know. If we got a few minutes to do that. Well, we can we can do it. Okay. It's no one's quick. Complaining. It. Uh, well, we didn't like each other a whole lot when everything blew up, or after it blew up, we were like, Ooh, yuck. <laughs> But we went to Christian counseling. They said, your spouse is not your enemy. Marriage is spiritual warfare. Uh, Pray together daily. We're like, how do you do that? Well, let me show you. So they showed us this little thing to help us get to the point where we could just start doing your Heavenly Father, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So this is the preamble to the prayer. And because we didn't like each other, they, they forced us to do this. But it was, uh, okay, so we're sitting in chairs, right? So, okay, face each other, hold hands, look each other in the eye. You know, I was fortunate to be wearing glasses, so if she did spit in my face, it wouldn't hurt me. Too much. That is true. But what they said was, okay, and me, being the prophet, priest, and king, which is like, I'm what? Prophet, priest, and king, you, you go first. Ooh, scary. Okay. Carol, I love you. Thank you for loving me. I would want to go. (laughs) But we faked it till we made it. So I'd say, thank you, Larry. And I love you. Thank you for loving me. And we'd have to say that two or three times before we'd really get in the mood to start a prayer. And I, I think the purpose for holding hands was so we wouldn't slap each other. <laughs> and so, okay, so we're thanking each other for loving each other. And, and then, I, okay, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this precious gift that you have given me. I'd say, liar, liar, liar. Pants on fire, you yeah. know. And, and then it would be, okay, you know, thank you for this, and, you know, help me be what I'm supposed to be, help us be what you want us to be, you know, those kind of things, like you'd said. And, and then on from there. But it was to be able to just to get close enough to be able to do the prayer together, right? And like she said, 
we spoke life into something that had died. So it was, the Holy Spirit was resurrecting a dead marriage. And something I just learned a couple of weeks ago, in order for a resurrection to happen, something has to have died. So if, if you're holding on to something that needs to be resurrected, you've got to let it die first. <laughs> okay? So that was just uh, the way they taught us, to be able to just get close enough <laughs> without hurting each other, to be able to start speaking the right way towards each other. and uh, Well, and to also be thanking God for keeping us together right. and for keeping the family together. And then we would thank God for things that, uh, that we did have, for my house, for my job, for the, for the family, and for each other. And, um, and then God asked him for the petitions, you know, like uh, James having surgery next week, protect her, her family, give her the strength to recover quickly and stuff like that. And then at the very end, um, you know, thank God and pray in Jesus' name at the end. But most people just jump right into a prayer that, God, I need $500 this week, you know, make it count. You know, you got to find us a way to make the car payment or whatever. No, you enter the throne with thanksgiving first, mm -hmm. thanking him for what you already have. And then you ask for the petition. I had been brought up Catholic. I used to pray to God all the time, but I never heard those things. And I certainly had never had a husband pray with me or over me. And even though Larry and I were still going through some trying times, that just blew me away. Yeah. I just I couldn't believe it. And now look what God did. He made us both ordained pastors and doctors of marriage ministry. Boy, does he have a sense of humor. That's what we wanted to share with everybody today. Yep. All right, well, that'll wrap it up. Next week, we'll be back. Christian living, Christian living. Christian living radio. It's a lifestyle. Christian living, Christian living. Christian Living Radio, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ 24-7. Our goal is to bring you a life-changing word through music and diverse programming, like the one you're listening to now. Pastor Kenyatta Goins is the visionary of Christian Living Radio, and he's dedicated to the idea that Christians should even have a more prominent presence in the marketplaces. Maybe you need prayer for yourself and or your family, maybe for a friend. We'd be privileged to stand in the gap for you. If you're listening to this broadcast, click on the Contact Us tab and send us your prayer request. We'd also like to hear from you if you have something on your mind or just give us some feedback. We support many ministries, so maybe you'd like to make a one-time or a monthly recurring donation. We believe that when you sow into these ministries, you'll indeed be blessed. And of course, if you sow into this show in particular, we believe that it's a blessing for you, so please consider sponsoring us. There's a special area under the Donate tab where you can send your monetary gift or call 520-812-6363. That's 520-812-6363 to receive more information about sponsorship. Thank you.